Hello everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you all here today to launch the Create Foundations Transitioning to Adulthood from Out of Home Care, Independence or Interdependence. But before we begin, I'd like very much to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of where we all meet today across the country. For me, I'm on Turrible land and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to the emerging young leaders who are with us today and all around Australia. I'd like to welcome you all, especially the young people joining us today, and a special welcome to our friends across the Tasman and to our international uh, guests who have joined us. Registrations tell us that we've got representation across every state and territory jurisdiction, and we've got a lot of decision makers in the group today also. And welcome to the CREATE board members who are with us. This webinar is being live streamed and it's also being recorded and it will be available on our website tomorrow, along with the key messages document and the First Nations resource. The full report of the launch today is available on our website today. This report is the culmination of many years work following up on our first major piece of research back in 2009. We've revisited this report, Transitioning from Care Tracking Progress, and looked at the issues and measured the impact and progress over the last decade. The report provides an illuminating and somewhat alarming review of what's happened over this last decade. And it's looking at our collective efforts over the last 10 years from the eyes of children and young people. There's still so much for us to do and some areas for us to celebrate this time. Today will be, for many of us, a sobering time given the amount of effort and dedication that's gone into improving this area of our work. However, as we all know, change does take time and the wheels do move slowly. But every effort that we make is a step in the right direction. We simply must ensure that young people, tomorrow's future, are supported to become confident members of society and not a statistic that keeps them glued to their roots of vulnerability and disadvantage. For this, I'm sure we all agree. This webinar is an interactive format and you're encouraged to send in through Q&A questions via Zoom. And please note that the questions, we'll take them up until 12 noon today. So a little bit about the format today. After our initial introductions, we'll move to the author of the report, Dr. Joseph McDowell, who present the report findings via a PowerPoint presentation. And then we'll have a panel discussion with young people who are young consultants at Create Foundation. And then we'll host the Q&A session towards the end. So I'd like to introduce our panel members and firstly, welcome our panellists to our first ever live launch via Zoom. So this has been a technical um, world that we're not familiar with. And today we've had a few hiccups getting here, but we're all good now. So here we go. So I'd like to introduce you to Emily. Emily is a young woman from New South Wales who's been engaged with CREATE for about five years. Emily's uh, currently 22 and lives with her nana and her child. And Emily has had incredible challenges, including mental health, homelessness, and issues with drugs and alcohol. She's a remarkable young woman whose courage and determination to overcome the barriers placed in front of her is truly inspiring. Emily is a proactive advocate and entrepreneur and selflessly gives of her time to assist the sector to improve the system to help young care leavers. Emily will be speaking today about the impact of the transition process on her mental health. So the second young person I'd like you to welcome is Andre. And Andre joins us from WA and Andre has made it very clear to me that it's not 11 a.m. in WA, it's actually 9 a.m. and he's here with us bright and early. Um, so Andre identifies as Indigenous and Andre's mob are Murray from Queensland. Andre is a young person who's been engaged with CREATE for a number of years and he's 25 now. Andre is a remarkably resilient young man and has overcome many obstacles to achieve his goals. Andre suffered setbacks to completing his education due to issues around stable housing and has first-hand experience of the impact of this on his post-care experience and on his life in general. 
Andre will be focusing his comments around homelessness. And lastly, but not least, is Adina. Adina joins us from Queensland and she's been engaged with CREATE since she was 15 years old. Adina is a success story in out of home care terms and has had a very supportive pathway through the transition process and has a double degree, tertiary qualifications and a great job. Adina will be speaking today about the importance of education and how she achieved great outcomes despite the many challenges facing young care leaders today. Yeah. So you can see from our panel, we have a, de a depth of experience with widely different um, types of uh, experience of the transition process and leading to widely different outcomes. But one thing that shines through is the absolute ability of these young people to overcome incredible obstacles to lead really fulfilling lives. The trouble is they have a rocky road to get there and that's what we're trying to reduce. So what I'd like to do now is to introduce you to Dr. Joseph McDowell, the author of the report, a board member of the CREATE Foundation and our executive director of research. Joseph's been tirelessly working to understand the barriers that seem to continuously impede us from making progress to achieve better outcomes for young care leavers. Joseph has written three of our report cards, all focused on transition, 2008, 9 and 11. And these have provided a comprehensive overview of the state of transitioning from care in Australia. His work is more than research, more than statistics and more than rhetoric. Joseph has worked with our CREATE team to develop initiatives and resources that facilitate the improvement of the transitioning process for young care leaders. He's also instrumental in providing a voice for these young people through many of his guest lectures at different universities and through some of his other publications that are limited um, by no means to this field. So Joseph has um, also helped us develop resources such as the Go Your Own Way Kit and been a really big player in our What's the Plan campaign that actually did get a little bit of result going back in a few years ago. So today it gives me great pleasure to welcome you all and to introduce Joseph and for him to take you all through the Transitioning to Adulthood from Out of Home Care report. Welcome, Joseph. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, it's just a, it's a pleasure to be here and certainly to be able to launch this report, which I think is so important for the young people uh, in our care system. Uh, I will try to share the screen to start the presentation. This is where I talked about the um, wonderful use of IT. So let's keep our fingers crossed and it will magically appear. We have a lift off. Right. Well, we're almost there. Today, what I'd like to do is very quickly um, just go back over what Jackie just mentioned, some of the work that we've done. Uh, in and out of home care, and particularly on transitioning from care, uh, to give a little bit of information about the 2009 report card, which was the precursor to the study we are looking at today, uh, to go through some of the findings that um, have emerged from this particular survey, and then to look a little bit at what changes may have happened over the last 10 years between 2009 and 2019, and the implications of these for practice. The, back in 2009, it was a fairly extensive survey. We surveyed governments. We asked a whole lot of questions from the government, but we also managed to talk to young people who were in care and a small group who had left care. And in that young person survey, we talked about a range of uh, issues, all of the important life domains that uh, confront all of us, I suppose, as we move through our life. And certainly for the young people, we were looking at education and health and preparation for leaving care, the formation of relationships, maintaining family contact, how they were faring since leaving care in terms of their employment, uh, any further study, and in general, the thoughts they had about the care system. 
The key findings from that report uh, really concerned us and, and I suppose acted as a precursor for all the work that we've done since. Uh, we found that um, just over a third actually had any real plan for their future. The, and a, a third of those had had little or no involvement in the preparation of it. And about half didn't find the plan all that useful. At that stage, 35% had completed year 12, 28% identified as being unemployed, but 54% were wholly dependent on Centrelink payments. So it wasn't a, a very a positive uh, discovery, I suppose, back in 2009. We found also that about half had to leave their care placement uh, when they turned 18. They, 35% of them were homeless at some stage in that first year. And 46% of the males particularly had been involved with juvenile justice. Well, after 2009, we spent a lot of time trying to help young people develop their plans. That seemed to be a real deficit that we needed to overcome. So we did a variety of studies back in 2011. We did the um, looking at the transition with uh, what's the plan campaign, which was a social marketing exercise to try to get young people to be more proactive in talking to caseworkers about plans. That didn't change things very much. So we tried in 2016, the go your own way evaluation where we prepared a kit that young people had when they left care. And this would be the, I suppose the, the format for developing a plan. It had a checklist and a template for a leaving care plan that the young people could work with with their, their caseworker to form the plan. Again, that did not achieve great outcomes either. So now in 2019, as a, an adjunct to the survey we did in 2018 of the whole care system, we asked young people who had left the system to give us some insights into how they were faring. And we were able to speak with 325 young people. And I must at this stage thank them profusely for the, the thoughts and the insights that they were able to share with us. That was truly remarkable and an amazing resource to have. As I said, 325 we spoke to. The, we weren't able this time to do a very detailed jurisdictional comparison because some of the smaller states and territories didn't have large numbers. The larger groups, New South Wales, Queensland, Victoria, were well represented uh, and we're treating this more as a, a national survey for young people being able to share what's happening across Australia. Of that sample, uh, two thirds were female, 22% were indigenous, 23% had come from residential care placements and about a third identified as living with some form of disability but only 58% of those were actually receiving support. The age ranges that we covered from 18 to 25 were pretty well represented. So it's a good spread of all the young people who had a range of experiences over that time since leaving here. Again, we talked to them about all of the key areas, a little bit on their placement history, um, and we added a question here that wasn't in 2009, talking about absence and placement. That was becoming an issue that we thought was worth looking at in more detail. We went through education, life skills and health, youth justice, preparation for leaving care, and also aftercare support. Focusing on accommodation, on their employment and finances, family connections, we spent a little bit of time specifically looking at the Indigenous young people because of their overrepresentation in the care system and asked about their future goals. So it's a pretty comprehensive coverage of young people in, well, as they have left care. Oh, their placement history is always interesting. We can see in this case that there were some 
variation across the states and territories. Uh, generally, the modal number of placements were three to four, but the average, because of some states being uh, much higher in terms of number of placements, the average was between five and six. So the first question that we set the young people before we really got into the details of the different areas was to see what they would tell us that they thought one or two really important issues that needed to be addressed uh, to improve the care system. What, what we found was that most of the young people, almost the 30%, uh, were telling us they needed more support and better support for leaving care, better preparation. Some mentioned that they had issues with caseworkers, that they needed more caseworker support and carer issues, that um, carers, they felt in many cases, could have a better understanding of the, the trauma-informed experiences. Uh, but generally, the, that extra support for leaving care was a critical factor. And I just included this as from one young person. That's a, a bit of a summary of really what young people were telling us, how difficult it is when they turn 18 and are supposedly independent and on their own. They've, the challenges can, in many cases, appear insurmountable. As I mentioned, the, one of the issues that we raised that was different from 2009 was about being absent from placement. So we asked young people if there were any times during their care experience that they had left their placement without telling people where they were going. And this was quite surprising because we found that about a third had said they would be, they were absent for a week or more uh, in terms of having left that placement and, and running away or being absent. Uh, certainly we found that those who had had that experience were far less satisfied with the, their overall care experience than the ones who had been in more stable situations. The reason they, they left care fell into two categories, what we could call push and pull, I suppose. The uh, push factors where they're feeling unloved, they're not heard, they feel like the, the world's against them, or they were actually experiencing conflict or abuse in the care placement. Uh, that, that's pushing them out of the placement. But also there was a, a lot who left their placement because of pull factors. They wanted to maintain relationships. They wanted to see their friends. They wanted to keep those connections. They wanted to feel normal. They wanted to simply be young people and have a little bit of autonomy and control over their lives. The interesting fact though, that when they returned, the big problem, I think just that, um, no, just that one. When, when they returned, the, the big problem was that they didn't, people didn't talk to them about what the issues were. And the number who just did not have any return interview to find out what the problems were, how they might be resolved. So this is one of the issues that really needs to be addressed. Uh, in terms of their educational experience, the, that was one of the good stories. As I mentioned, uh, about over, an average of 57% had completed year 12. That varied depending on placement type. Those who'd been in home-based placements were able to, or, or 50, sorry, 67% of those in home-based placements have completed year 12, but only 41% of those in residential care. So where you're placed can be a, a critical factor. Also the placement frequency, the, the stability or instability of the, the placement is important. Those who had one to four placements, 68% had completed year 12. Whereas when we moved to the group that five or more placements, only 47% of those. So being in a stable home situation is incredibly important for completing their secondary education. When we asked about what, who was supporting the young people, the carers uh, for 20% were very important, uh, but friends also, the peer groups, a group some need to be considered as well. Uh, but 
the thing that really disturbed me was that we have about 18 percent um, who said that no one supported them no one helped them above and beyond the teachers with with any sort of educational activities health health's always one that seems to be handled reasonably well the difficulty that most of the young people reported was that they needed support in accessing the treatments. They, the treatments are there, the support is there, and they're, they're probably familiar with it through their time in care, given the health system we have in Australia. But they really needed somebody to be there to help them access whatever services they required, and particularly services that involve mental health. In terms of family contact, young people were saying that Obviously, it's quite likely that, that many will go back to their birth family uh, after they leave care. 55% had were living with siblings of the ones who had returned to live with some sort of family member. 84% uh, though, who weren't seeing their siblings on a regular basis, not living with them, wanted to contact the siblings and were keeping in touch. So sibling contact is an incredibly important aspect that, again, we have to be aware of when we're looking at the supports provided. 63% of the respondents were in contact with their mother, but only 50% had any contact at all with fathers. You can think of that the other way, that 50% never saw the father. And that's a, a sad situation in terms of role modeling and general parenting. Looking after themselves, most of the young people felt that, that they were handling that reasonably well. Uh, certainly they can get around, they managing to keep house, uh, look after themselves. They're one of the difficulties though, that again was surprising, was that they found it hard to make friends. That was one of the hardest aspects. And we know that the more disrupted the placements are while in care, the more disrupted they're going to be after young people leave care. And obviously that disruption makes it very hard to establish social connections and social networks. Youth justice, as we know, is becoming a major issue for young people in care. The nexus between those has been looked at in incredible number of uh, research and AOHW has done a major linkage project looking at the connection. Uh, we found that about 37% had had youth justice contact uh, while they were in care and some of those would be contact because of the orders and the court activity surrounding their placement. But again, 21% had still been in youth justice after they left care which is a considerable number. Again, the, the type of placement the young people were in had an effect on the, the youth justice contact. Only a, a quarter of those who'd been in home-based placements were involved with youth justice, but 56% of those in residential care have had that experience. So the satisfaction with their care experience um, Again, the rating is around about 60 in some of the states, but when you think that we'd like to see it up around 90, that would be desirable, but in some areas, the satisfaction is really quite low. The involvement with uh, transition planning um, uh, looks, about two thirds of the group have been really involved in any sort of planning. They, their rating was 66 out of 100 for their level of involvement. But for those who'd been involved, um, they were at least about half were 80% or so uh, in terms of their connectedness with the planning process. But again, only 67 they rated 67 out of 100 for the usefulness of the process. One of the critical things about leaving care is where young people are going to live after they turn 18 and 
possibly move out of their placement. Well, what we found was that 51% in 2019 remained with their carer. So it's still around half will remain with carers and the other half have to find some sort of alternate accommodation. <clears throat> Where they lived immediately following leaving care for the 49% who had to go somewhere else, um, a lot went back to the birth family, but most finished up in some form of supported accommodation. Now that is good at the start, but it's not a permanent arrangement. And those situations break down very quickly. And we find that when we look at the longer term over the first year after young people have left care, that large numbers, an overall average of about 30%, uh, were homeless at some stage during that year. And this is, doesn't, it's not an ideal situation for us to be exiting young people from a system into homelessness. I looked at this because the interesting thing was that we know that if you stay with your carer, all the literature shows that young people who stay with the carers are more likely to achieve satisfactory outcomes in their situation. And we can see that certainly they're far less likely to be homeless if they stay with the carers and they feel more supported. In terms of Indigenous young people, uh, the comparisons showed that only on four situations, four, four areas, were the Indigenous young people different from non-Indigenous? And that was in completing year 12, fewer completed year 12, uh, more had been absent from placement, more were involved with youth justice since leaving care, and more were likely to be parents. So very quickly in conclusion, I'll just run through some of the comparisons between 2009 and 2019. Well, as I said, we had a win with education, 57% compared with 35% had completed year 12. Uh, it was also encouraging to see that more young people are remaining in education. More have been involved, even though the number with the plan hasn't increased or changed, more of the young people have been involved in the planning process, which is a very good thing. The services that were accessed most in 19 was housing, whereas it had been health in 2009. Uh, accessing documentation is still just around the third um, that find it difficult to do. And the one concern was the number who know about and have access to it. That is not increasing. And we would really hope that being a, a valuable resource for young people, that the numbers would be going up, they're going down. Self-care, again, nothing significantly different there. They were still managing and, and the, the percentages that we're looking at are around the, the 40%. Uh, as I said, with education, more are in still continuing study and more are involved in part-time employment. Finances, again, the numbers are still high who need support from social service through Centrelink. The number of working casually has increased a little, but there's still a lot of uh, welfare support needed. The number who are parents has dropped a little bit uh, recently, but the, the young people who are parents desperately need support with childcare. And it's probably connected to the fact that many of them are involved in part-time employment and education so they need support for looking after their children while they're engaged in those activities. The numbers we talked about so remaining with carers, the number still was 49 in 2009, it's 51 now. Um, the numbers homeless and so forth are still fairly similar. The obtaining accommodation is a little easier that they're finding, but still not significantly different. So what have we found? 
I guess with the exception of education, which was a little bit of a win, uh, there are not a lot of differences. In fact, there are fewer improvements because a lot of cases are going backwards. So after 10 years of national standards that we've been living through, that we've had royal commissions and Senate inquiries, not a lot has changed. So I wanted to close with just a couple of questions that we could ask ourselves in reflecting on this. Why do we still expect the young people who leave care to be independent, to be able to be autonomous and look after themselves when mainstream young people are really supported to be interdependent? They're able to come back to the family whenever they have a need. Why can't the young people in care? Secondly, why is it that irrespective of the type of child welfare system, whether it's protection oriented like ours or family services oriented as the Nordic countries, how come the outcomes for young people who've been in the system are worse than for other young people? Are we content to claim that the few who successfully navigate the system, probably those that Mike Steen refers to as the moving on, who'll be fine no matter what. Why is it good enough for us to claim those as best or evidence of our best practice? Is it ethical or acceptable for some young people to have a care experience that is positive, uplifting, supportive, rewarding, fulfilling, yet others have to endure just the opposite in the same system. And finally, are we prepared to continue with a system that politicizes support for vulnerable young people by operating through fragmented programs that could be funded or cut pretty well on whim and very little evaluation on how effective they are and certainly not in the best interests of the young person. So final thought, let's try to change our thinking. Let's see if it's possible for us to eliminate the concept of leaving care, remove that thought and see what sorts of changes that might lead to in our care system. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Joseph. Um, I think the report really illuminates those 325 young people who um, shared their experiences uh, really well with us all today. Um, I'd like to now turn our discussion to hear firsthand from young people that we have on our panel today. Um, there's a, uh, we'll follow a set format where I'll ask the young people some questions and then um, they'll provide their responses and we'll do each young person in turn. And then at the end, as I said before, we'll um, have time for questions and answers. So the first um, young person we'll chat with is Emily. So Emily, you've had an incredible journey through the care system with some significant highs and some significant lows. How prepared did you feel to leave the care system when you were battling with ongoing mental health issues and did your plan incorporate ongoing support? Hi, Jackie. Thank you for your question. Um, from my removal uh, to independence at 17, I received a lot of financial assistance in talk therapists, counsellors, psychiatrists, um, and my general mental health. Um, however, once I turned 18 and became thoroughly fully independent in myself, um, I started discovering that I had complex post-traumatic stress disorder and would need to have specialised DBT therapy. Um, however, none of this was outlined in my leaving care plan as it was something that was new information to us. Uh, before that, I felt as though I only struggled with um, anxieties and depressions and didn't realise the full extent of um, what my trauma had put on me. Um, so I was unable to financially support my mental health um, when I became independent and I ended up slipping into a much more comfortable environment um, for me, which was substance abuse and alcohol. Um, I had my son at a very young age of 
16 and continued to push through education and do my HSC. Um, however, at the completion of my HSC, I was vulnerable, I was stressed and I did go through homelessness and felt as though um, substance abuse made me more of an adult and gave me a familiar um, sense of belonging um, that I really, really struggled to gain. Um, again, now at 22 years old, I financially um, am responsible for my own mental, Ill, uh, mental health support. Um, I do have mental health plans um, that I get done through my general practitioner, but it is out of pocket um, except for the Medicare rebate. So none of that has been involved in my um, leaving care plan or addressed um, since then, no. Support and preparation was very variable. I, at that age, if you had have asked me, do you feel prepared to be 18? I would have said, yeah, I feel very prepared. But now looking back at it and having had struggled through the very normal realities of growing up to be an adult, I now realize how little um, preparation I actually had um, to be in that position. So yeah, Jackie. And I wonder, um, Emily, we talk about, you know, mental health plans and we are all very grateful in the welfare sector that they exist for young people, but it seems a little bit ridiculous that you get allotted a certain amount of sessions. Um, one thing that we do know from history and from all the, you know, inquiries that we've held that the forgotten Australians and also the people that were part of the Royal Commission into institutionalised sexual abuse, that they required ongoing long-term counselling. So why would we think it's okay for young people transitioning today with trauma backgrounds to just exit and have to fend their way through getting, you know, X amount of visits for free every year? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that part of our platform very much needs to be that we need to advocate for a better way of young people accessing post-care mental health support. And uh, Emily, when you left the system, you mentioned to me that you had only three months left on your lease and you were basically sort of couch surfing. Um, how did you manage to work your way through that to, to become the successful young person you are today? <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. Um, look, it's pretty straightforward um, answer. Having a child um, really develops a sense of um, structure and security um, within yourself. Uh, so having the mentality as a young person um, that substance abuse made me stronger and made me an adult, um, being a mother actually trumped that completely. So my first support um, as an independent person leaving out of home care was my NA group, my Narcotics Anonymous group. Um, and it really brought to light um, a lot of the things that I had known about meditation and self care and um, mindfulness and taking care of yourself and also apologizing and being responsible for your behavior and your actions and um, being able to acknowledge that. So um, moving on from my substance abuse, I developed a lot more of a mother nurture. Um, I've never had my son removed from my care. Um, I have a very supportive father of my son in the picture um, who has been a guiding light through a lot of my trauma struggles um, post care. But my son was definitely the person that uh, highlighted the need for structure and resilience and support for not just myself, but the community that will raise my son as well. So it really pulled me out of um, vulnerability and gave me a sense of strength that was authentic and something that I could really push towards. So, yeah. 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 And it's amazing how that um, primal kind of protective instinct can really make you, um, you, you, you know, that mother bear instinct is so powerful, isn't it, to get you through. And the other thing I was going to ask you about too, that in your last year of school, you talked to me when we chatted about the difference that having supportive people in your life made because you were actually really supported with a young baby to be able to finish your um, schooling. So can you tell us a bit about that? Absolutely. It's one of the more joyous times um, of my care experience was the period in which I had my son. Um, I was so wholeheartedly supported financially, um, emotionally and physically. I received government grants for my son's daycare experience expenses over two terms. Um, I received help with taxi accounts to get to and from school and to drop my son off at daycare in the process, as well as having all of my hours um, paid for with a licensed instructor. So I got my P's quite quickly. Um, full support to graduate high school and complete my HSC, as well as have fun in that as well. I received um, 
assistance with, from family and community services to travel to Europe in my 12th year of school, as well as support to transition out of um, my foster care establishment when my son was six years old. So that's helped with like car insurances, bonds and um, all that sorts of stuff. And that was fantastic right up until my very last HSE exam in November of 2016, um, where they decided that instead of cutting me off is weird. it's how I'm going to put it because that's what happened they cut me off um, instead of doing it at 18 in September they extended it until my last HSE exam because they felt as though that was the resolution of my youthhood um, and I can tell you now from that day I have not received a phone call any follow-up any sort of assistance it has been it was blinding almost the amount of support that I received when I had my son to finish school um, but since then I have not I got into early entry into um, UNE and UON and I did not continue that. I felt unsupported in doing my TAFE course of Cert for and Community Services, which took me three years to complete rather than the regular 12 months it should take. So my support networks post-care were completely different, full yeah. switch from previous to that, Jackie, yeah. And that's that's just astounding, isn't it? That uh, And we talk about this abrupt ending and that is a really strong indicator. So we did some great work as a system whilst you were in the system, but this magic eject button um, when young people turn 18 is, is just devastating to hear because should you have had that, it would have made your life and your child's life um, far much easier and given you more opportunities to, to fulfill that dream of yours to get that education. Um, so look, that's incredibly powerful. Thanks, Emily. Um, so look, we'll turn now to Andre. And as we mentioned before, Andre um, is an Indigenous young man um, from Queensland originally, his, his mob are from Queensland. So Andre, we were gonna talk to you a bit today about your experiences um, as being homeless. So as you were transitioning from the care system to live independently, when you were going through that transition period, was housing a feature of your transition plan? Um, was it a feature? Uh, with my transition plan, uh, we didn't have really a plan. Um, it so the was absence more, of a plan. Yeah, it was more of a... Um, uh, all right, let's get this. We'll do. Oh, you need your wisdom teeth. Let's get your wisdom teeth taken out. You need glasses. Sweet, get your glasses. Uh, let's get your passport. Let's get your identification. Uh, yeah, that should be about it. Um, there was no plan for the future at all. Uh, they thought that the housing I was in was stable enough as it was. Um, and was it, uh, Andre. Uh, unfortunately not. Uh, it was roughly about three months uh, after I left care, after turning 18, uh, that I had that accommodation wrapped up uh, just due to me ageing out of that uh, accommodation. And so can you talk to us, like, I think we can all imagine, uh, many of us in the sector have children of our own and some of us are at the age where we have our own children looking for accommodation and all of us can empathise because the, the market at the moment and in the past has been very difficult to get into. As a young care leaver, how difficult was it for you to get into, you know, to find suitable housing? Um, it's been very difficult. Uh, I haven't actually been able to do it by myself and not on my own. Mm -hmm. the, like currently I am living in a, a private rental that with a friend and without having that friend here, I would not be able to afford this place. I would not be able to be here. Mm -hmm. uh, past places as well. I was, uh, when I was with my girlfriend, we were uh, two years just always searching for houses and we just couldn't find stuff um unless it was on nras oh yeah uh a lot of the times we would apply for a house and we'd be knocked back because of our age yes. they're like oh no you're too young we don't we can't trust you or oh you guys are just on centrelink you can't afford this mm -hmm. um even though we've budgeted it into our centrelink we're like no we can afford this Yep. like trust us to be able to afford this and they're like no no yeah it's about it's over 50 percent of your income you can't do this blah 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 um 
just always constant pushbacks. Um, and it'd be good to just hopefully the private rental market loosens up a bit. And did you have um, access to supported housing as part of your plan? So when I turned 16, uh, we, me and my caseworker at the time, we went ahead and we, I was put onto the uh, housing wait list. Uh, unfortunately, when I turned 18, uh, it dis I it apparently disappeared from the list. Uh, there was no follow-ups, nothing. I found out a couple of years ago after going in to be like, hey, what's going on? They're like, oh, you were removed from the list because we couldn't contact you, even though none of my contact details have changed. So... And I guess I'm it's really hard sure. when you're actually looking for stable housing to have a way of contacting you other than a, a mobile or whatever, mm -hmm. having a physical address would yes. change a lot, I would imagine. Yes, I believe uh, after I turned 18 to currently now, it has been over 20 places. Yeah. And Andre, what's the impact of this? Like, I mean, there are many types of homelessness. So there's the living on the street kind mm -hmm. of um uh, homelessness that most of us imagine but mm -hmm. there's also people with just couch surfing you know catching yeah. a night with a friend here and catching a night there or you know having a relative that might keep you for a short place mm -hmm. a piece of time so what's the impact of that like for you at, at, like not only for you mentally and physically but also for you with your other prospects in your life about getting in you know further education yeah. or a job uh so something I'm a big advocate for is making sure people can identify the difference between homelessness and rooflessness. Um, and knowing that there is, that they are two issues, both linked, but at the same time, you can be homeless without a roof, but you can also be roofless without a home. Um, and you can see this with nomad tribes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the, issue for myself when I uh, was experiencing homelessness was I couldn't focus on anything else. The only thing I could do was survive. Mm -hmm. And that for me was finding housing. Yeah. I ended up dropping out of uh, TAFE. Um, I was studying chefing. And technically, I am not actually a fully qualified chef as I am missing my last few units because I couldn't finish them uh, at the time. And since then, I haven't actually built up the energy and stuff to go back and finish those units. But with being homeless, I can't focus on anything else except surviving and make sure, making sure I've got a roof over my head. Yeah. So the, it's kind of the fundamental foundation of stability is to make sure that young people transition from care into stable, affordable housing. 100 percent as a parent the state is totally responsible for making sure that happens and i think that we have to hold them accountable for that because it's not okay what you've just described is life-changing andre to, to be able to um just survive is not what we would want as a trajectory for young people 100 mm. percent well, thank you, Andre. And now we're going to chat with Adina. And Adina is actually from um, Queensland and has a very, very different um, experience um, during her uh, time in care. And what we'll hear from Adina's story is the foundation points that were okay, that made this transition much easier for her. Not to mention that she's an amazingly fantastic young woman and filled with resilience and courage um, to achieve like all of the young people, but there were some key things that were in place for this journey to be a success. So Adina, you've achieved a lot and you've completed two degrees and are working full time, amazing. So we can see in our report that there is a significant um, improvement in young people finishing uh, grade 12, not what we want to see compared to the general population, but we've seen an increase over 10 years. So tell us what helped you finish your education and go on to study, not only just finishing your education for grade 12, but doing tertiary study. Thank you, Jackie. I think that the biggest thing for me 
being able to achieve the things that I have is the stability that I experienced during my care experience. I entered care at the age of 11 um, and went into the care of a teacher aide at my school. Um, and because of that, I was able to stay in the same school, same town, um, stayed with the same carer until I was 18. And then when I turned 18, I was even able to stay in my placement for as long as I wanted. Um, it wasn't one of those situations where you turn 18 and, and that's the end of it. Um, my foster carers became my family and there, that's where I spend Christmas now. Um, that's where I know if I have hard times now as a 24 year old, I know that that's a place I can go back to if I need to. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that when we had our chat, when you talked about the, the, the comfort that the foster family gave you, that you actually did your university study and lived away from home and, and had accommodation at the university. Is that right? Yes, that's right. I went and lived on campus. And I think that was another um, great experience for me living in that supported accommodation, I guess. Um, all of my meals were provided. I didn't have to worry about transport. I was able to explore the world at my own pace. Yeah. I wasn't pushed into getting bond money or paying rent or getting leases. Yeah. So you have the focus on um, education, which is often the absolute linchpin or the key to um, being able to um, achieve in life is that the education is the key. So did you have a plan during like when you were in the transition phase, did your plan really map out the education journey that you would take? Absolutely. I was really, really involved in my transition from care planning. I can't remember what age exactly it started, but I know that it definitely started at the right time for me. Yep. Um, from so the age of about... What time do you think is a good time? Sorry. Well, I guess it depends on the young person. Everybody's different. But yeah. because I had all of my basic needs met, I was in the perfect position as a teenager to um, start looking about what I wanted to do. Mm. And your caseworker was very supportive in this process. I remember you telling me that they just went out of their way and you ended up with scholarships for your university studies. Yes, absolutely. My, um, I was supported by my CSO, my carers, um, the CREATE Foundation and lots of other people um, who sent me links for scholarships, um, who helped me support, for, helped me apply for Centrelink. Um, I was lucky enough to get a Smith Family Scholarship, a Zonta Scholarship, lots of scholarships with uni. So all of my financial needs were able to be met. Um, That's amazing. Those, well, yeah. I, I think that we need to mention that you are in Queensland. So for the yeah. Queenslanders watching, this is what success <laughs> looks like in the transition process. So what can you say to those working in the system now to help other young people achieve? I think that um, throughout my experience, there were so many amazing people who I worked with who did everything they could to empower me um, and to fill me with lots of positivity and tell me how great I was and, and how proud they were of me and all the things I was achieving. And I think that having all of those um, positive affirmations given to me constantly really, really um, empowered me to go on and, and do the best that I could. And, and I think I guess is... setting the bar high and, and our, yeah. in our expectations that young people will succeed mm. um, is a key to that, isn't it? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, look, I can't think of a better panel that we could have ever had to talk about um, the transition experience. You've all come to us, Emily, with overcoming some incredible obstacles um, and being um, incredibly resourceful to be able to, um, you know, reach some of her goals. And Andre, um, he's like, he's so close. Andre, I'm going to dog you to find out that you finished those last couple of units because you can cook me a meal when I next head over to WA. And Adina, what a wonderfully powerful story for those of us who've been slogging away in this space for the last 15 years. Um, Joseph and I, are incredibly passionate, as is the entire CREATE Foundation, about creating a better life for young people in the transition experience. But can I just say that 
Transitioning from care, as Joseph mentioned before, is an anathema. What a ridiculous thing for us to be saying. Our language absolutely needs to change. And for young people in the general community, would we be expecting them on their 18th birthday to be totally focused on next week, I've got to find my own accommodation and figure out how I'm going to pay for uni while I'm living with my mates? Um, we just wouldn't do it, would we? We just wouldn't expect it. So why would we expect the most vulnerable young people with histories of abuse, neglect and trauma to have this magic date that where they become emasculated? So let's change the dialogue. If there's one thing we can do, let's transition to adulthood or transition to interdependence, but let's never have the expectation that a vulnerable young person has to transition from care. So one government seems to have got it right. Well, almost. The, the, the proof is in the pudding because it's a promise at the moment. Some steps have been taken. So the Victorian government, in amongst this crazy world that we're living in, in COVID times, has pledged enormous resources and reform for young care leavers. And they've embraced the, the um, home stretch campaign, which is not only enabling a young person to be able to stay in the care of their carer till they turn 21, but also in residential care. And it wraps supports around them in a brokerage arrangement. arrangement. So during COVID, the Victorian government, the Minister Denellen, announced that he would be pouring resources so that every child leaving care in Victoria would have access to this program. So we applaud the uh, Minister in Victoria. And we've got a video to show you um, with the Minister speaking to us and, and announcing his proud achievements. And hopefully if the tech world works right, we'll head into the video now. Hello, although I'm not able to join you all live today, I'm very grateful to Jackie Reid and the team at CREATE for giving me the opportunity to speak on a topic I feel extremely passionate about. We know it's hard for teenagers to leave home, even in the best of circumstances. But for young people who have spent much of their lives in care, and for many who have experienced significant trauma, leaving care can be even more difficult. The finding from CREATE's Transition from Care report show almost a third of young people across the country have experienced homelessness within a year of leaving out of home care. These statistics are heartbreaking, quite frankly, unacceptable. In Victoria, we've done something about it. Last year, in my proudest moment as Minister for Child Protection, I announced the Victorian Home Stretch Program would become universal. In an Australian first, this meant that all eligible young people in out-of-home care could be supported by the Victorian Government until they turned 21. And now we are taking our landmark program a step further expanding home streets so that even more young people can benefit from these life-changing supports. In the new state budget, the Victorian Government has invested almost $39 million over the next four years and $13.8 million ongoing so that young people on permanent care orders can also be confident they'll have a place to call home until they're 21. This means that permanent carers will be eligible for a care allowance to help them continue to care and support the young person they assume parental responsibility for until the age of 21 years. If remaining with their carer is not possible, young people will be able to receive an allowance to transition to independent living. Our progress to support our Victorian care leavers would not have been possible without the tireless advocacy of families, young people, carers, community service organisations and of course CREATE. I would like to thank the members of the Ministerial Youth Advisory Group also, who I've had the pleasure of meeting with regularly and who have consistently advocated for these supports. No doubt there is more to be done, but we're so proud of what we've managed to achieve so far. Wow. So that's, uh, that's left us feeling a bit inspired, I think. And, you know, I've got one thing to say. If one government can make it happen and make young people a priority, then others should as well. So this is the challenge for the CREATE Foundation over the next 12 months to really mobilise ourselves to put pressure on other governments and look at the Victorian model to learn from it and just to see hopefully in the next couple of years that we can turn this whole negative situation around where we will see young care leaders fully supported. 
So I'd like to thank um, Joseph McDowell for his incredible presentation and his tireless work in this space and to bring to life the voices of the 325 young people. And I'd like to also thank very much the young people for being on the panel today. So thank you, Adina. Thank you, Emily, and to Andre. So this is the, the formal part of our launch concluding. And now we're ending, we're entering into our um, interactive discussion where we'll have a few questions that have come from the audience and I can see there are lots of them and we will be looking very much at putting some of those questions to whatever panel member they suit so if you just hang five and I shall go into my secret little room here and see what questions we've got there so one of the questions is, and I think Emily, you might be the best one to answer this for me. How do we make it? How do we make transition plans meaningful for the young people? Oh, that is a really good question. Thank you. Um, I'm a very big believer, and I've done this pitch before in blended families. Um, I have always wondered why we don't match foster parents to biological parents and try and build relationships for young people like that. So I extend the same um, mentality and ideologies with uh, leaving care plans. You need to involve the you need to involve everybody in that child's network. You need to create that community and strengthen that community through adulthood. Um, I'm very close with my foster parents. I'm very lucky to have them in my life. Um, they still regularly support me, um, whether it's just receiving my mail when I'm homeless or cooking me a meal or picking me up if my car runs out of fuel. That is a relationship that is strengthened through their involvement of my leaving care plans and me transitioning to adulthood. Um, I extend the same things to my nen and my um, aunts and uncles who have also been involved in that transition period and therefore I feel confident that I can receive support from them. So it is a whole network thing. Um, we need to understand that young people are variable. Um, young people, it, human condition is variable and it's not something that we can write down in paper format. Uh, we need to consistently be reevaluating these young per, young people's plans and consistently giving them support. Um, I do believe in the home stretch program and extending the age care to 21, but I also believe that we can go above and beyond that with really tailoring and utilising the idea of blended families Family and that it takes a tribe and a community to raise a person. So really extending that um, ideology, Jackie, thank you for your question. Yeah. Um, look, the other, uh, it really picks up on your point that you've already made, Emily, but one of the questions here is, um, do you think, um, uh, how do you feel about the extending the care age to 21? And I'd be really interested to hear Andre's views on that. Um, Andre, do you think it would have made a difference in your life if you had been able to stay in a residential setting or in your with your carer until you were 21 would that have made enough difference would it have been good for you 100 percent um the most like uh going back to my care experience the most stable i was was when i was in residential care um i'd built up basically a family there um with the other young people in the house but becoming like my brothers and sisters um, and the carers becoming people that I can rely on. Um, when I aged out of uh, residential care, it's a lot, a lot of things started going wrong. I don't know if it was from me uh, losing, uh, losing that or if it was from me uh, not wanting to go. Uh, I feel like it was the latter, but having, oh, now I've, I've completely lost my train of thought. It's completely right. disappeared. Great. So Andre, if you, if you rethought back to your time, um, obviously the, the home stretch program is more than just being able to, you know, be able to access your uh, a carer for that time. Mm -hmm. um, it's also about the wraparound supports and also getting an allowance if you are living by yourself. Um, is there enough support at the moment um, from the government for young people who are transitioning in the sense of monetary, like an allowance? Uh, from what I'm aware of, the only thing is available is TILA. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there is a lot of young people who aren't connected with like a transitional support service or their caseworkers at all. 
and don't know how to access it or don't even know it exists. Um, and then also the amount of that money will be able to buy maybe a fridge and a washing machine if you're lucky, a couch. Yeah. Um, be secondhand probably because it's only yeah. $1,500. Yeah. Um, when I used mine, I was very, very lucky that I found this secondhand place that was willing to work with my budget and I ended up getting a fridge, a washing machine, a dryer and a couch. Well done. Um, which was like, oh, wow, that's actually insane with this amount of money. Uh, um, now, I wonder how they, um, I think it must be based on a budget rather than that's what young people need, right? So that they've got 1500 mm -hmm. which is an arbitrary amount of money, but it's not really taking into account the, the types of things it would. 100%. It's home. also, um, I, I believe it's not taking into account how prices have changed over the years as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And not taking into account, oh, yes, I could get cheap stuff with this, but is this going to cost me more money energy-wise? That's right. Um, yeah. Or is it going to break next week? Because exactly. It's a old chair. Mm. So the other question here is kind of a big picture one. I'm going to give it to you, Adina. Um, it says, um, a lot of things don't seem to have changed. Why? Why are we still talking 10 years on about transitioning from care? What do you think's got to happen to make it better? Oh, goodness. That is such a big question. <laughs> I was actually thinking um, during Joseph's presentation that it's so sad that the things that we were talking about 10 years are still, 10 years ago, are still happening now. And even when I first started working with Create, um, it was all the same messages being put forward and yet, not much has really changed. But I think that there just needs to be massive work done right up the top because we've got fantastic people working on the ground, helping young people, but they can only do the best that they can do with the limited amount of resources that they have. And, and it's just it's not enough. Staffing? Is staffing an issue? Yeah. Not enough staff on the ground? Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Not yeah. enough staff, not enough carers, not enough money. <laughs> Yeah. And I'd like to put the same question to you, Joseph. Um, you know, what what do you think has got to give? Well, uh, I think, as, as I alluded to in my last question, uh, it comes down really to political will. We had that wonderful presentation from the Victorian minister that shows that even in the most dire circumstances, if there's a will, governments can make things happen. And if they understand the issues facing these young people and want to do something about it, they can. And your point, I think, was marvellous, that if one government can do that in Australia, why can't all the others? Mm -hmm. And that will be our job over the next 12 months to really push that thought. There's another question here, and it's and it's an interesting one, and it's one that we often um, offline have many conversations about. And the person's asking, I wonder if we could compare the life outcomes of children in care with those who are not, and how many finish school, how many experience juvenile justice, how many become homeless, um, because then it might become more real. Like, I know that often we, we have stats about, you know, how things are, in, uh, are dire in this space, but if we were comparing them with the general population, like we've done it with education, and that's a sobering figure because we can see 90% of young people in the general community um, are definitely, you know, achieving year 12, um, but only 57% in the care area. Um, so if we did that around juvenile justice and we did that with um, figures sitting around um, homelessness, would that make a difference? Do you think it would give us, some people would take more notice? Did, would you like me to speak to that? Yes, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think that's a very uh, important thing for us to do and certainly something I'm really interested in following up, uh, I think, we, you don't want to be painting an incredibly negative picture. And I think looking at some of the results that we found in some of our other studies, uh, looking at health and well-being, for example, 
recently we did a consultation in CREATE talking with young people in care about health and well-being. And I was able to use a standardized measure that has been used around the world to look at health and well-being. And we found, for example, that as a comparison, Denmark, which we all think is a, a wonderfully socially advanced country, uh, the average in Denmark of this health and well-being index was 70 out of 100, which obviously is fairly high. But we found for our care group uh, in a very particular sample, they came in at 67 out of 100, which is not far removed from a, a very advanced society. So, and we found that 90% of the young people in care feel safe and secure. They're happy in their placement. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of good stories that we can tell and a lot of positives that we can build on. But obviously there's a lot of areas. And I think it's, as the young people said, that and I think it was Andre who, who said that things were, no, well, um, Adina, Adina. Um, when, when they were in care, things were great. They were getting all sorts of support. But as soon as they turn 18, that seems to be the, the off button. And I would just love to see and be able to say at the end of our activities that young people in care would be as excited and looking forward to their 18th birthday and all the wonders that that was going to bring as all the other young people in the community. Yeah, that's a sobering thought and a very visible thought, isn't it? Um, so back to you, Emily. Um, when you talked before about, you know, when we talked about the transition planning process, um, this question really goes to what you were trying to explain. It said, do you think service providers understand that the transition plan isn't just a form, but it's a whole process of building relationships, support networks and stability and security for young people? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Great question. Um, and again, I, do, I don't want to speak, apologies, I don't want to speak on behalf of um, or social workers or case workers, but no, I do, I do believe that they do not have the understanding that this is somebody's um, life and their whole tree. This is their roots and their stability and their growth. Um, and it is the first format of that. I believe it to be um, kind of an ideology created by case plans because of the consistency in doing case plans, um, doing school case plans, mental health case plans, health case plans. Um, I feel as though when we put leading care plans into that same type of bubble, we receive the same type of um, energy uh, from the case workers. So I really believe in tailoring and specialising leading care plans and the whole transition into independence into a much more itself own independent thing it, it shouldn't be lumped in with um, case plans and care plans it shouldn't have the same structure um, I met a beautiful woman actually at a create event years ago um, who specializes in leaving care plans and she if she had to spend 10 minutes with it, with each of her clients it'd take her about 10 years and I really think that that shows an understanding of how underutilized, underfunded, and how under-resourced the yeah. whole transition into independence is. Um, I don't believe that services are accurately aware of the out-of-home care situation enough. I believe that we receive too much stigma and stereotype that when we present ourselves to services, it's very much a questioning thing. Um, I believe that if we were to look at the statistics of young people in out-of-home care compared to young people in regular as I would say, homing situations, we would also see a highlighted of people that don't know that young people are in out of home care situations. So yeah. coming into adulthood, we really got to remember that there is a whole stigma for that young person, that even if you're creating that plan, how well can that young person utilize that plan in action? Yeah. Do I have the confidence to go to my organizations in my town and say, I am a young person that was in foster care and I need your help? Or does that seem too difficult to comprehend? Because it does. Yeah. So I genuinely believe that it, we need to change our ideologies around leaving care plans because they are not the same as case plans. They do not have the same effects. They are not. They need to be long term yes. and variable. Yes, I completely agree. I mean, it just goes to that point where we talked before about mental health. You get ten free you know, appointments or five or whatever it might be. And then it's kind of, you've got to get back into the um, the ring again the next 12 months when you get allocated another whatever. We, we need a, a much better 
individualised package surrounding young people to leave care. And that kind of brings me to this next question, which Adina, you might be well equipped to answer because you've done a lot of work for CREATE, you're working as a professional. So this question says, do you think adults in government policy are actually open to hearing from young people and respecting their views um, of what they need for planning and leaving care? Um, my experience as a young person transitioning told me that the well the people that I was working with were absolutely um, willing to hear from me. Yep. Um, but then when I think about presenting at inquiries and speaking with ministers and all of those sorts of things, it's a bit it's quite disheartening to see that the things that that we presented at inquiries to all these fancy people all those years ago and we're still talking about it today and nothing's changed yeah. so it, it's it's kind of yes and no yeah and I guess for me that just to see the Victorian minister he that was such a genuine heartfelt video like he really identified with and could understand the issue and I think one of the things we've been talking a lot about at CREATE is trying to depoliticize this. It should never be about money it, or about a political view or you're going to get more money from the Liberals or the, the, the Labor, whatever it is. We need to have bipartisan support and a commitment to young people and then dollars should follow it. Um, we've got to move away from this siloed approach. I think that might lead us to much better outcomes for young people. How we get there, I'm not sure. We've had talks about a summit, um, but we, you know, we need to um, we need to see how that develops over time. Um, so, Joseph, um, we've got a question here that really relates to uh, young people with disabilities and how they're. Um, transition is even more complex than what we've heard from all three panel members today. Did we get any information in the report that really highlighted any issues specific to young people with disabilities? Not, not specifically in this report, um, but we certainly have done a lot of work recently following the COVID pandemic, uh, looking at the young people with disability and the, what the issues that they're confronting. And certainly, as, as you indicate, the, the problems that many young people are just compounded um, when we were looking at young people with disabilities. For the, one of the big issues that we found was trying to ensure with through the planning process that the young people understand what the plans are about and that they are engaged and involved in the preparation. Where we think of for young people in the, the general stream, they quite often get left out. Well, it's even harder for young people with a disability because a lot of the time it's assumed that they don't understand what's going on. And so a lot of them, they'll talk to carers and will develop plans through the adults without actually talking to the young people. So I think, one thing that we really need to look at is making the, the whole communication with young people with a disability user friendly in the sense that they understand what's going on, that they're engaged and that they are active participants in the planning process. And could I, could I just add, not just on the disability, but one thing I was thinking as we were talking about the others, that this, this leaving care, it, it's a long-term process and what we need is long-term support and we know that trying to get caseworkers to be the people who would be supporting young people after they've aged out of care uh, is very difficult because caseworkers are strapped as it is dealing with young people who are in care and that becomes their highest priority so we need a system as they have in the UK and as we've trialled here in various locations, always successfully, always seen as being fantastic, but we need a personal advisor or a mentor type model where the young people have got somebody that they can relate to, that they can call on to help them, making decisions, doing the basics, getting their bonds sorted out, whatever they need. 
that they've got that person they can rely on, that they know will be there to support them. And this has been happening in the UK for years, decades. Um, and it's, it's an incredibly successful system. The literature shows that we can develop it using our own informal social networks. So we don't even have to draw people from a, a highly professional area. It, it works really well if you find young people within a young person social network who can be trained, who can be given the understanding of what's available, and they can act as those mentors that are trusted and valued by the young people themselves. So something we need that's long-term, that's going to give the young people that continuing support. So that brings me to sort of the last question that we'll ask. And Andre, how would you feel about, or do you think it would have made a difference for you to have a mentor in your life to help you, uh, you know, through the transition process? Most definitely. Uh, I like, while I was in care, I had uh, people who I'd classify as mentors. Uh, I was very fortunate that uh, during care, I was at the exact same school for the entirety of my time. Um, and that's because I had people at the school advocating for me and pushing for what I needed. And transitioning from 18 um, into uh, independence or as it should be interdependence um, would be absolutely fantastic i'd be able to i i feel like i'd be able i I'd, I'd, i think i would have been able to finish my chefing uh, oh, course. No. well that's my goal on right yeah. so Adina, would you have would you have made use of a mentor should one have been available to you or did you have an your own sort of informal mentor I actually um, have been in, still in contact with a, quite a number of my CSOs and my um, CV and lots of other people who were involved in my care experience. And it has been amazing to have those people um, who are there and willing to pick up the phone and answer my questions and listen to me and give me advice. Um, I've called up old CSOs on a number of occasions and asked, why did you make this decision about me? Um, and I've been able to get answers and yeah, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been really yeah. great. And Emily, did you have any informal mentors or um, people that you could turn to to help? And if you didn't, do you think they might help other kids? Um, not in the sense of uh, informal mentor, like holistically in my um, life. I definitely had uh, teachers and role models with who I still keep contact with today that are, you know, references on my resume and um, able to assist me with questions or anything that I really need. But um, in the sense of actually a close confidant, not not really, but that is actually something that I exercise in my role today and what I do um, individually um, is I do a lot of mentor roles and um, individual work with young people who are struggling to assimilate um, and things like that. So I very much um, feel as though lived experience representation is getting a lot um, higher and um, as a lived experience representative, um, I'm being able to use my voice and my experiences a lot more to help cater to the needs um, that young people have that have similar experiences to me. Yeah. Um, so I really believe that, you know, mentoring is fantastic, but it's also we don't want to create a new network for high turnover rates and low corporate morale. So um, I really believe in the voices of lived experience advocates. And I think if we uplifted um, people transitioning into independence more, we would have the mentors available um, to help rewrite this system completely. So, yeah. I think that the role of um, there's informal mentors, formal mentors, there are um, peer mentors, which you're describing, um, there have been a number of organisations and we've got a lot of chat in our um, chat screen here about like there have been numerous attempts at having um, mentoring programs running and often the funding is cut and I have first-hand experience of that. I developed a volunteer support mentoring program in Queensland many goes years ago and it lasted for about 10 years and then I sadly heard that it had rolled over. One of the hardest things about mentors is to prove hard outcomes and governments seem to want hard outcomes yet sometimes we all know in the real world that things that are hard to measure are sometimes the most important for humans. So I think we've got a long way to go to really stress the importance of both 
you know, young people, peer mentors, and also um, formal mentoring programs, because often when they're run by volunteers, the cost is minimal, but the interaction with the young person and to have someone in your life assisting you and, you know, trying to be an extra voice in a system that's swamping you could be really, assist, you know, of great benefit. So look, we come to the end of our wonderful webinar today and thanks for everybody who's participated. We've been absolutely overjoyed with the response. Normally we host our webinars um, in, in quite small groups. So this is our first large one. And our launches have often been in Sydney over the years to an audience of anywhere between you know, 75 and 100 people. So today has blown our socks off with the amount of people that have been able to join us. And now because we're recording this, we're able to circulate it um, even more widely. So our state coordinators will be using this as a tool to be advocating in their states. And as I said before, the um, we've got a, um, a resource that sits alongside the main report, which is a key messages document. And we also have a First Nations resource that's all going to be on our website from tomorrow, could even be up today. Um, and um, the report is there for everybody to see um, from today. So we couldn't get to all of the questions. So there will be a frequently asked questions on the website that will go up on the end of the, the launch. And um, so I'd like to say a big thank you again. Thank you very much to our panelists, um, Adina, Andre and Emily, and thank you very much to Joseph. It's been a pleasure hosting this, my first gig. Um, so all the best to everybody and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.